Hello, I'm Peter Carter. I'm going to uh, present to you um, my impressions and some, abstract, some extracts that I've taken uh, from the most important scientific report, certainly the most important report for uh, everyone who is interested and concerned about climate change, but also the most important report for anybody who is uh, interested and concerned about our future, the future of humanity and, in fact, life on Earth. So this report, of course, is the IPCC's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Changes uh, Sixth Assessment Working Group 2 report. And Working Group 2 is the impacts and uh, vulnerabilities. I watched, um, uh, I watched the uh, uh, press release, I watched the uh, video coverage of the uh, IPCC presentation. And um, they had uh, key speakers like the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, and uh, he was followed by the IPCC chair, uh, Dr. Hassan Lee, who is an economist from uh, South Korea. And then that was followed by uh, lead authors from the IPCC report. Now, I, I mention this because they were all, I mean, they um, presented the report, you know, conservatively, but it was very clear that they were all um, very, very worried indeed uh, by the report. I should also mention that the head of the WMO, World Meteorological Organization, and the um, head of UNEP, uh, United Nations Environment Program, were, were also there. And um, you could really tell their, um, their deep concern about what this report means, but more than that, uh, the fact that uh, the governments have made no response whatsoever to the um, IPCC reports, which have been going on since 1990. And um, now, Antonio Guterres, the uh, UN Secretary General, uh, said that these impacts are so present time and so severe uh, that the absence of action by governments, what the UN calls ambition, um, has now reached the level of a crime. And uh, I totally, totally agree with that. Um, this has been um, the crime of all time for quite a long time. And I find myself absolutely astounded that uh, we have this sixth assessment and nothing's happened. Nothing's happening except more pollution, except more planet-destroying and future-destroying dest greenhouse gas pollution, mainly, of course, from the fossil fuel industry. I got a few quotes here to share with you. So um, an IPCC author made, I thought, a, um, a, a very succinct uh, quote that really captured um, the entire assessment and where we're at, something that I've been saying for quite some time now. He said that climate change is happening way faster, more severely, and more widespread. And in saying that, um, he said that uh, we ever anticipated before in previous IPCC reports. Um, nobody ever believed that we would be in this situation by now. Um, uh, the reports based on uh, previous computer models um, had projected that the sort of disaster impacts, disastrous impacts that we're seeing today, and of course are well known um, all over the planet, uh, they were not expected to happen until uh, 2050 and after. So uh, we are definitely in a dire, dire situation. And that leads me to the quote from the IPCC chair, Dr. Lee in which he said, this report is a dire warning about the consequences of inaction. It shows that climate change is a grave and mounting threat to our well-being and to a healthy planet. Now, um, this statement is quite extraordinary, actually. Um, uh, IPCC chairs do not give warnings. Um, this has never happened before. Um, uh, and this is a dire warning. 
And um, I'd been trying to communicate for some time that the uh, global climate emergency is a dire emergency. It's actually a climate system emergency. Um, it's the climate, but it's also the oceans, also the forests, also the waterways, um, practically the whole biosphere living planet. And the um, presentations at the press release made it clear that there are multiple disasters to catastrophic impacts uh, which are getting worse and were, as I say, much worse than earlier had been um, assessed. The media um, had some good quotes, um, but I'm sort of glad to be doing this because I don't think the impression of really the dire warning really came from the media. Um, uh, there was one very good quote, um, it was a headline, which was, we have to act while solutions still exist. And that definitely came out from this working group to report. Another thing that I read in the media, um, another headline was that um, climate change is accelerating, and it's been accelerating for quite some time, um, it's accelerating faster than we are able to adapt to it. Now that's a very, very good key quote. And it did come out from this working group to report a few quotes then. Uh, we have a threat that um, the authors have already said to a livable future. Um, the cumulative scientific evidence, they say, is unequivocal. Climate change is a threat to human well-being and to the planet. So we now are in the situation where climate change is threatening our very future. Any further delay in concerted, anticipatory global action on adaptation and mitigation will miss a brief and rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable future for us all. Um, we really don't have a window. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Lee, as I say over and over, has said that emissions must be put in decline immediately. And that, 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 that's easily possible. It's evil crime of, of subsidizing fossil fuels to uh, get that kick started. Um, but this is very, very strong language from scientists. There are billions of people now being affected. Approximately 3.3 to 3.6 billion people live in contexts and regions that are highly vulnerable to climate change. And they're already being severely impacted. IPCC says they have a high confidence in that statement. They go on to say that human-induced climate change is causing dangerous and widespread disruption in nature and affecting the lives of billions of people around the world, despite efforts to reduce risks. Well, it's a nice thing to say, but you know, there really hasn't been any efforts to reduce risk. As I say, the governments and the corporations have been ignoring risks and uh, piled on um, catastrophic impacts for um, the generation of today's children um, to face. So, um, of course, we all know about extremes. So climate change and related extreme events will significantly increase the health and premature deaths from near to long term high confidence. So what that means is that these extreme weather events, particularly um, the heat waves, but also droughts and floods and superstorms, um, from now on it's going to cause an increasing number of deaths worldwide. So we're into uh, the killing stage of global climate change. And on heat waves, um, uh, the quote is that uh, the global population exposure to heat waves will continue to increase with every additional increment of warming. And we already know from working group one that um, that leads to uh, 
multiple times increase in uh, heat waves. And uh, these are extreme heat waves. Um, even back in the 2014 uh, fifth assessment, the IPC said that, well, nothing is more certain than the fact that uh, with continued global warming and continued emissions, um, heat waves, which are already increasing in severity and frequency, they said heat waves will continue to increase in frequency, in severity, and in the uh, region that they affect, so the populations that they affect. Now, all of this is happening at a global warming, as the panels have said, of 1.1 degrees C. And the decision was made in 2015 um, with the Paris Agreement that uh, it was not acceptable to use the 2 degree C limit anymore. Um, that would be catastrophic. The science was very, had become very clear on that. And that the danger limit was to be 1.5 degrees C. And um, the 2018 1.5 degrees C IPCC report said that to limit warming to 1.5 degrees C, actually to have a reasonable chance of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees C, emissions had to decline by 2020 at the very latest. And um, uh, emissions, particularly CO2 emissions, had to be cut 50% by 2030. And UNEP, actually, there are past two reports. They put an annual report out called the Gap Report on Climate Change and Emissions, um, said that this applies to 2 degrees C now as well. So not only to limit to 1.5 degrees C, but also to limit to 2 degrees C, emissions had to have been declining in 2020. And here we are in 2022, and uh, there is no plan to uh, do anything that's going to uh, put emissions into reverse or put emissions into decline. So there was a um, section on uh, climate hazards. And one of the things that came out very strongly from uh, Working Group 2 report, it was also in Working Group 1 report, was um, that we are increasingly going to see um, combinations of extreme weather events. Um, uh, coming at the same time in the same region, um, uh, coming um, severely in multiple crucial regions on the planet, and um, also coming in close proximity, um, uh, which they call compound extreme weather events. By way of reference for you to uh, read these over, I'm slipping in here a selection from uh, AR6, the projected future impacts that show that 1.5 degrees C is globally disastrous and that 2 degrees C is global catastrophe. There are so many severe projected future impacts at 1.5 degrees C that strongly reinforce the imperative from the AR6 Working Group 3 that global emissions must be put in decline immediately and rapidly. The, um, um, the head of UNEP um, put this very, very well, actually, uh, very graphically. Um, she said that we are being hit by climate change now, over and over and over again. And we're being hit severely. And she said, unless we respond now, um, that's how the future is going to be. Um, the world population, and this applies to all regions, she said, are going to be hit more frequently and more severely. So we've reached that stage of climate change now. We've reached disastrous and catastrophic climate change and the suffering and dying phase of global climate change. So um, these climate hazards and multiple impacts, so the quote is that concurrent and repeated climate hazards occur in all regions. That's what we're seeing. That's what we're committed to in the future. And these include increasing impacts, increasing hits to, um, to health, population health, to ecosystems, to our infrastructure, 
to our livelihoods and our food production. So um, all of those essential aspects of our survival, um, they are going to be hit worse. Even if we do put emissions into immediate and rapid decline, um, that's, they are going to be worse. Because it takes a long time. I mean, if there's one thing that has always been known about climate change is it takes a long time for the climate system to respond. And um, to slow these down and to stop them um, also takes a long time. So I pray to God um, that our governments will, our corporations will, um, uh, smarten up, um, see the horrible error of their waves, look at the future, look at the billions of people that are suffering today, and uh, put those emissions into immediate decline. But because of the inertia, the lag, things will even then get worse. So yeah, adaptation is absolutely crucial. Um, there's a lot in this working group too from adaptation. And so we come to um, uh, what I have focused on for decades with respect to climate change. And that is food and food security. And um, as a physician, of course, um, uh, I have to immediately go to food and water um, when it comes down to climate change. Um, because we have known for decades that as climate change increases, food security and water security decreases. And um, we have a, a billion or more um, people on the planet who already live under water insecurity, live under what's called water stress. Um, and we have an increasing number of people um, uh, under with hunger and malnutrition. Um, with United Nations and international efforts, um, world hunger over the past decade or more has been slowly coming down. But over the past three to four years, it's going back up again. And that's due to climate change as well as conflict. And climate change and conflict, of course, go together. Because climate change damages and uh, robs populations of their uh, natural resources for the survival. And um, this kind of thing is already happening. So what about food then? So um, uh, uh, food impacts increase. They're increasing with frequency and intensity with respect to all these extremes. And this has already, in this report, reduced food and water security. So the world is already in a global food and water insecurity situation as a result of today's climate change. So it doesn't take much imagination to um, figure out how, how, how that's going to play out in a most terrible way um, uh, on global warming above uh, 1.5 degrees C, for example. And um, there's been a couple of really very amazing, um, clever studies have showed that despite the fact that um, food production continues to increase, um, uh, and the IPCC reports it here, that over the past 50 years, there's been an increasing climate change drag on that increase. So the uh, potential that would have been expected for the continued increase um, has been cut back. So even though food production is increasing, um, uh, climate change for several decades now has been impacting on that adversely. That is a very important research. And so, not surprisingly, they say increases in the frequency, intensity, and severity of drought, which we're going to see, of floods and of heat waves, and continued uh, sea level rise affecting the coasts and the islands, will further increase the risks and impacts to food security. And that will affect major food producing regions. That's what it says here. It's absolutely right. Oh, and it says there's high confidence on that. And um, of course, that's already happening in vulnerable regions already and rapidly getting worse there. 
Above 1.5 degrees C, the report says that global warming results in increasingly concurrent compound climate extremes which will increase simultaneous crop losses in major food producing regions. So that's the um, climate change um, multiple bed basket research that's been done. And so um, already um, the scientists are projecting and warning uh, that we're probably going to see this. We're probably going to see the major breadbasket food producing regions of the world, including Canada, where I live, um, uh, impacted by this um, concurrence, this confluence of these multiple extreme weather events. Uh, diseases, um, of course, they're increasing already. Um, uh, climate sensitive, here's the quote on that one. Climate sensitive, foodborne, waterborne, and vector diseases, that's malaria, etc., are projected to increase under all levels of warming. So we're talking dengue, we're talking malaria, we're talking food poisoning, um, we're talking diarrheal diseases, particularly affecting uh, the very young, little babies and, inf and infants. And they're going to increase. Um, uh, even with our best response now, um, we have committed these people, these huge numbers of people, um, uh, to this increase in these horrible diseases. So I come to uh, um, the other thing that's interested me most, and of course that's actually the very worst impact of global warming. And we've known for a very long time that the worst of all possible impacts of global warming is the feedbacks to global warming, is the fact that global warming has impacts on the planet by which the planet increases global warming. So this is why global warming is inherently extremely dangerous and always has been from day one. They, um, the policymakers have um, um, did a bad job on the feedbacks. Um, uh, if you read through um, the report, um, you're probably not going to see these feedbacks at all. Um, they just mention them. Um, it's a sort of very quick mention and it's in a place where you would least expect them to. They mention the feedbacks, the worst of all impacts, within um, their chapters on adaptation. So that's the policy makers that have done that. So the most severe impacts, which should have been way up front in this report, are almost invisible. Uh, they mention it, as I say, consequences of current and future warming include amplifying feedbacks, and uh, this is actually lodged in confusing um, other language, um, uh, to the climate system high confidence. So yes, we're going to get feedbacks to global warming. Um, uh, they're going to amplify global warming um, more, and that's definite. But um, you'd be hard pressed to actually find it in, in the Working Group 2 report. Now, they talk about overshoot. Um, the report gives a very strong impression um, that we can still limit to 1.5 degrees C, which is absolute um, rational and scientific nonsense. And it's nonsense of the most misleading kind because our emissions are so high and our atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations are so unprecedentedly high and all of them are accelerating that it's absolutely impossible to limit warming to 1.5 degrees C. And as the previous uh, projections from the models of the IPCC say, we're going to be at 1.5 degrees C around 2030. So it's absolutely terrible that this is being denied. Because the result of this denial is that actually no governments, no industries, no corporations are doing anything to prepare for what's going to hit the world in uh, less than 10 years. And that's because um, 
they're fudging the situation. And God knows why. Um, uh, um, massaging the situation of what we're committed to um, does nobody any good apart from the fossil fuel industry, maybe the big banks. Um, Dr. Hansen, James Hansen as usual, has uh, put out reports, his own scientific reports, um, several of them, and explained, no, 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 no. It's absolutely impossible to limit to 1.5 degrees C. So all of these impacts that I've been going through, we're going to get, and we're going to get them a lot worse, because we are only at 1.1 degrees C now. Now, as James Hansen says in his latest report, we will be very hard put to limit warming to 2 degrees C. So um, they've hidden the dire emergency here, OK? By saying, well, we agreed in 2015 to limit to 1.5 degrees C, and we're not doing anything, actually. We're just burning more fossil fuels. Um, we'll just keep saying, we'll just keep pretending that we can still limit to 1.5 degrees C. So um, this is why um, this warning from the IPCC chair, this is our last warning. The next time, it's going to be too late. So this whole working group one and working group two IPCC reports are our last warning. We have to respond to this. And if our governments aren't, as many organizations have said for years, the world population has to mobilize, um, activate, and force our governments to um, basically stop killing the future. Um, uh, and, um, yeah, we have to use those terms with them because that's what they're doing. Um, as um, Secretary General Antonio Guterres said, said, we're now at a global crime situation. And so on the feedbacks, uh, to get back to the report, another quote that I've got is that the risks of severe impacts increase with every additional implement of global warming. Um, uh, we heard that in the uh, 2018 1.5 degrees C report. And uh, during overshoot in high carbon ecosystems, so that's where the carbon feedbacks come from. Um, uh, as global warming progresses, the forests absorb less carbon. There's more forest fires. They emit carbon. Actually, a lot more carbon than we ever realized. A report just came out on that. Um, and the uh, peatlands, which are wetlands that contain huge amounts of black carbon, they emit more methane. And with global warming, which is already happening, it's been happening for many years now, um, the permafrost, um, uh, the largest pool of carbon safely frozen until recently, uh, the permafrost starts thawing and starts releasing. And for several years, the permafrost has been re-releasing all three greenhouse gases. It's been releasing methane, yes, but it's also releasing CO2, again, in much larger quantities than the science ever anticipated. The more science we do over the past decades, the worse everything gets. I mean, that's just a constant theme. Um, uh, the more research we do on a particular aspect of climate change impacts, the, the worse we find it is. The more rapid we find it's happening. The report says that the consequences of current and future global warming include amplifying feedbacks to the climate system. And as I say, in high carbon ecosystems, such impacts are already observed. As I've explained, they are projected to increase with every additional increment of global warming. And then they have all the uh, feedbacks here. But as I say, they're kind of hidden in the adaptation chapters. But yes, they will increase with every increment of warming, and that includes an increase in wildfires, an increase in mass mortality of trees, an increase in drying out and warming of peatlands, an increase in the thawing of permafrost, and a weakening 
of the natural land and carbon sinks. And all of those will cause increasing releases of greenhouse gases. So there's my most important concern. Uh, there's my biggest concern, because that's the absolute worst impacts of climate change. Um, uh, if, therefore, uh, governments and these corporations don't act now uh, to put global emissions into decline, um, it's literally a death sentence um, for our future. Um, they actually have a very interesting um, uh, section which is actually under the frequently asked questions. And I've noticed this before in previous assessments. Um, the FAQs, and I've recommended these to people, uh, are really, really very good. Um, they're very clear, they're easy to understand, and um, uh, um, they, don't, they don't fudge their words. So there was one section for the first time and the question posed by the IPCC, of course, was, if we continue to do nothing, what is it going to mean for today's children? And it makes horrific reading. Absolutely horrific. Um, but it was a great thing that they did to put it in there. So, again, I encourage everybody to... The FAQs are an easy read. So... Um, the way to start with this report, actually, is probably to start with the FAQ. Um, uh, read the press release. Um, uh, press release is pretty harsh. Um, and then you can go to the SPM. But um, Now, I want to now mention one thing that is particularly good in this report. And it's very important that I mention it. Um, because otherwise um, people will probably gloss over it. Since 2001, in order to avoid saying dangerous or disastrous or catastrophic, um, uh, the IPCC came up with this um, means of communicating um, risks and impacts under different levels of global warming. And they did this with an um, illustrative um, method uh, which has been uh, called burning embers. They call it reasons for concern. And reasons for concern is IPC speak for um, uh, these must be avoided at all costs because this is catastrophe. Um, so they have these, they call them RFCs. And initially, there was just five of them. And they're mighty useful. But when the 1.5 degree C report came out, there were much more. Um, and this report has more than ever. It has multiple impacts, multiple regions specific, specified with their vulnerability um, uh, to uh, impacts at particularly temperature increases. So two degrees, three degrees, and they're really, really excellent. So uh, many of these um, reasons um, for concern expressed as impact and accompanied with these is the text of what they really mean. Um, if you really want to uh, make a shortcut to understand very clearly um, what we're looking at here, you go to those RFCs and read the fine text along with them because, oh boy, they have it all down there. Anyway, it is all in the um, uh, working group two. The two degrees C impacts, they're all in there. They're all awful, disastrous, they're catastrophic. Uh, they reflect the language which was used uh, by the chair of the IPCC and by uh, the lead authors. So, my final statement is to repeat Dr. Lee. Global emissions have to decline immediately and rapidly to avoid 2 degrees C. And um, again, in this report, he said, this report is a dire warning about the consequences of inaction. It shows that climate change now is a grave and mounting threat to the well-being of the human population and for a healthy planet. So um, I certainly appreciate Dr. Lee. Um, he has been um, very forthright. Uh, with his statements in COP25 and COP26 and here. So I, I, um, I will finish by saying I, I really do appreciate his messaging 
And also, I want to say I really appreciate um, our uh, excellent uh, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, um, uh, because he has been powerful on what he would probably call the climate change file. Um, so I encourage everybody to get down, um, read these reports, get to know everything, and then you're going to know what to do. So thank you. Let's do it all together.